So, you want to know what in the world is a Presbyterian? Well, grab a cup of coffee or a cup of your favorite beverage and stick around and find out. Hi, I'm John Judson and I want to welcome you to this video series on what in the world is a Presbyterian. As I've said before in other lessons, Presbyterians are Christians who believe certain things and govern themselves in certain ways. In this video, we're going to be talking more about why we govern ourselves the way we do. And we're going to do that by talking about the historic principles of church order. Think about these as a framework that if you understand these, you'll understand everything that is in the Book of Order and why we do what we do. And so there are eight of these distinctive principles of church order. The first, God alone is Lord of the conscience. No one can tell you what you must believe. We cannot, as people have said across the centuries, bind your conscience. We cannot say this is what you absolutely must believe about God or about Jesus Christ or about the Spirit or about the Church. Ultimately, as I tell people, that uh, when we all get to the pearly gates, God is not going to ask, well, what did your church tell you you should believe and did you believe it? God is going to ask, what did you believe and why? So, God alone is Lord of the conscience. The second is that each church sets its own criteria for membership. Uh, at the churches I've served, the criteria for membership is a profession of faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. In the Roman Catholic Church, uh, they have a more extensive uh, catechism class that both children and adults must go through in order to join, to say, here are all the things we believe. When I was pastoring in San Antonio, there was a church across the street from us, uh, an evangelical free church, and they had a booklet that if you wanted to become a member of the church, you had to read the booklet and agree to believe everything in the booklet. But that's part of what it means to be the church, is that every church gets to set its own criteria for membership. Third, the church needs officers, or the church needs elders. Now, in a previous video, I talked some about this, but there are two reasons why the church needs elders. First, it's biblical. Whether it is Moses who chose elders to help him judge between people, judge arguments, decide who was right, whether it is the Apostle Paul, who every place he went chose elders to help run and guide the church. Uh, the office of elder is biblical. And so Calvin believed, John Calvin believed, that that ought to be how we govern ourselves, is through a board of elders that we call the session. But there's also a theological reason for this. Calvin didn't trust either the individual or the masses. Calvin believed that sin was so powerful that uh, Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And that's what would happen if you put all power in a church in a single individual. But Calvin also didn't trust the masses. He believed that ordinary folks could be swayed by a particular speaker who could lead them astray. Think of Jim Jones in Jonestown, charismatic leader, and he led his people to drink the Kool-Aid. And so, um, we believe that what we need are officers, elders, who will thoughtfully and prayerfully lead and guide the church. Next, there must be a connection between faith and practice. What I mean by this is that you cannot divide out, or, or the Book of Order says, you cannot divide out faith and faithfulness. To have faith is to be faithful. To have faith is to have works. As James said, faith without works is dead. 
And all throughout the Old Testament, the prophets are continually telling the people that all of their sacrifices uh, don't matter at all if they aren't actually out there protecting the widow, taking care of the poor, looking after orphans. And so, there must be a connection between faith and practice. Next, people can disagree and still be faithful. This is one of the most difficult things that we Presbyterians try to practice. That in the world around us, often people say, well, if you don't believe like I believe, you are wrong and you should be out, out of the church. But what we believe is that people can adamantly disagree about things and still be faithful. And part of this comes out of our theological understanding that none of us know the mind of God. None of us are God and know the absolute truth of anything. And so if none of us know the absolute truth of anything, then we ought to be able to disagree with one another without being disagreeable. And so people can disagree and still be faithful. Next, a church elects its own officers. Again, this is, this is so because we believe that only the church, the congregation, can know who are the right people in its midst to lead and guide the congregation. Only the congregation can know who its elders ought to be. No one can tell you in the Presbyterian Church USA who ought to be your elders. Now, there are very, very rare occasions when Presbytery might step into a church that uh, is having a lot of trouble and will temporarily act as leadership in the church. But ultimately, they cannot say, you will select this person or that person to be an elder or even a pastor in the life and work of your church. Next, and this may sound obvious, but God is not bound by our decisions. We human beings have a tendency to think of ourselves as knowing everything God knows. And that when we make a decision, we know it's also God's decision. And God must be bound by what we say. Um, what Scripture calls on us to have, though, is humility. And to recognize that we can speak as best we can, we think, for God and for Christ and for the Spirit. But ultimately, what we say and do cannot bind God, just like we can't bind other people's consciences on what they believe, we can't bind God. Finally, the church exercises discipline. Again, I've talked about this in another video, but here, just as a reminder, the church needs to protect the individual from the group. The church needs to have processes in place that will protect an individual from uh, lies and gossip and uh, the oppression of the larger group. At the same time, the church needs to be able to protect itself from the individual. An individual who may be um, abusive, who may have gone totally off the rails theologically and biblically, the church needs to protect itself from the individual. And so, we exercise church discipline. Again, this is biblical. Um, and, the process, and the purpose, let me say this, the purpose of church discipline is not to oppress someone. The purpose of church discipline is restoration. It is always about restoration. It is always about second chances. It is always about forgiveness. It is always about learning and growing. And so that is the context in which we exercise church discipline. Well, now you know a bit more about the historic principles of church order. I hope this helps. Uh, you can always read more about these. But again, if you know these, uh, you will understand uh, more fully why we as Presbyterians govern the way we do. So on this day, be grateful. Find something to be grateful for. And have an amazing day, and thanks for watching. Bye.